Chapter 3, Lifting and Moving Patients. Just to point out, the easiest way to get your patient into the ambulance is have them walk on their own. But for, unfortunately, most patients that need an ambulance can't do that. So we're going to have to learn how to lift and move patients and protect ourselves as we do it. So the biggest thing we need to worry about right here is understanding body mechanics. Lift with your legs, nose between your toes, keep your back straight, locked in. All great ideas, basic mechanics, until you get the patient that doesn't know that they're supposed to be in a proper position for you to use all these good mechanics. So we're going to learn the body mechanics. We're going to learn how to apply those the best we can in every situation and how to improvise when needed. Things to consider before you start moving a patient is how much does the patient weigh? What kind of uh, connecting points do you have to lift them? Are they on something you can hold on to that will hold them? Is there something you can put underneath them that you can use to help lift them? Or can you have them help lift themselves? So look at the weight, how much support you're going to have to provide to get them to move. And the other is where are you going to take them? Once you pick them up, have a plan on what you're going to do. Know your limitations. If you're a shorter person, you might not want to be on the top of the uh, patient where you're trying to go downstairs and you need to be a taller person. You might want to have the taller person move around. Think about what you're doing and who has what limitations. Have a good plan. Communicate before you do anything so that Everybody knows what you're going to do, and if something goes wrong, everybody has a plan on what to happen. Worst thing that can happen is everybody picks up your patient, ready to get them over onto the cot, and then you say, where's the cot? Nobody brought it from the ambulance, and now you've got a patient in your arms, and no one left to go get the cot for you. So think about it, make a plan, have good communication. Keep your feet on nice, firm ground. Make sure that you're uh, about a shoulder widths apart or a little bit more if you have to. Nice, firm, flat surface, if at all possible. Unfortunately, not every patient knows that's where they're supposed to be. So sometimes you're standing in rocks, sometimes you're in water, sometimes you're in other body fluids that you don't want to ask what they are. So get your feet in a nice, good, firm position. Use your legs as much as possible to do the lifting. Don't use your back and your arms. Your legs are big muscles. Don't twist or turn. Once you pick the patient up, move your feet, not your back. Your back is not made to turn sideways. It's not made to apply pressure when you bend over. So use your legs and move your feet. If you're trying to lift with one hand, you're not doing good because it's everything out of balance. You've got two arms, so you can lift with two arms and get the same pressure on the back. You lift with one arm, it's different pressures and it hurts your back. Always ask for help if you think you're going to need it. There's plenty of help when you ask. Keep the weight as close to your body as possible. Unfortunately, some patients you do not want to keep close to your body, but you're going to have to so that you can protect yourself from your back issues and you can always take a shower later. We do have a great device called a stair chair. If the patient is conscious and safe to be in an upright position, you can put them in this chair and you can actually slide it down the stairs or up the stairs on dollies on the back, kind of like a furniture dolly. It's very comfortable for your patient, very easy to use for you, but they have to be conscious. They have to be where they can protect their own airway. So some things to think about. This is kind of an example of a stair chair. This is the older version. The newer ones actually have the tracks on the that angle back from the bottom and you can just slide it down the stairs like you would a, a, a refrigerator dolly. One thing you got to remember though is this guy here on the base that's holding the back of the guy walking backwards. He is trying to provide some support and give him guidance on where the next step is and he's counting off steps because the guy walking backwards doesn't have an idea of how many steps down he's going. So it's um, something very important. If this is happening and the person behind you, the hand slips below the waist and actually touches parts that you would normally file a gr grievance against, just remember they were trying to help you and something slipped. Now, if it happens every shift, that might be an issue you want to take to HR, but I've touched people's butts before. 
by accident, and it's all meant in trying to save them from falling backwards, and everybody gets over it. So, but if you do it too much, then you're gonna get in trouble. So don't try to by, try to be a little careful. The power lift and power grip. You notice he's using his legs to lift on that picture on the left. On the right, that's what we call a power grip. You have your hands underneath whatever you're trying to lift so that if you do lose your grip, you've still got your fingers underneath it and you won't drop it. When reaching, keep your back in a locked in position. Don't twist, don't bend. Keep your back straight as possible. Avoid reaching more than 20 inches in front of your body. If the patient's laying on a bed and you can't reach him, hop up in the bed. Look where you're setting your knees and then slide across to where you need to be to get close to your patient. In some uh, situations you will have to reach. Try not to do anything too strenuous. Try to avoid it at all possible and use all the potential tools you can to prevent this. When pushing or pulling, it's best to push. Pushing gives you more leverage. Pulling puts more pressure on your back. So use the push. Keep the back locked in. Keep your nose between your toes. So keep your feet spread wide enough that your nose stays in the center. And keep everything as close to your body as possible. For every inch you extend past your body, your, your muscles perceive 10 more pounds. So that 100 pound patient, if you are keeping your arms out far away from you, they're now a 200 pound patient. So you got to be aware of that. Keep them as close as you can. If the patient is down low enough, you might want to get on your hands and knees. They make some really good EMS pants with knee pads in them now. Highly recommend that. That would have saved me a bunch of knee injuries. So get the knee pads, push or pull if it's below the waist. If it's overhead, get a ladder. Find somebody taller. Do something to get to the patient where you don't have to be reaching over your head. All right, we're going to talk about the different types of moves here. Emergency moves. Somebody's going to die if we don't do something now. So things like cardiac arrest. The car is on fire. There's a bomb about ready to go off and you got 30 seconds. Things like that are what we're looking for. So some type of uh, care needs to be given. You've got a person laying on a bed and you need to do CPR. You've got to do an emergency move to get them to the ground where it's hard and you can do good CPR. You can't do CPR on a bed. It bounces too much. Maybe you have to move the patient to get to a critical patient. So you've got two people in a car and you have to do an emergency move to get one out of the way to get to the more critical one. So that's an emergency move. Here's some examples. Grab them by the shoulders, by the, the shirt, and start dragging them. Just get down your hands and knees and drag backwards. Incline drag. Look how he's got his hands up underneath the armpits of the patient and then grabbing the wrists. That way your hands are locked in with their arms and they you even if you let go, you can't drop them. When you're going downstairs, always grow, go head first. Do not grab them by the ankles and drag them down the stairs like that. That's not a good thing. You might cause more problems. Firefighter drag. I have never seen a firefighter that could do this with a helmet on and an air pack, but that's what they call it. Put their kind of wrap their wrists together, put it around your neck, and then just straddle them and crawl. That is a long crawl. It's not really an emergency because it's going to take you forever. This one works even much better. Put them in a blanket, grab the blanket, and just start dragging. They make skeds or sleds that you can put patients on. That's what they use in hospitals when they do evacuation drills, is they put them on these slider things and slide them down the stairs. But uh, it's one way you can get them out. Or just pick them up and walk them. Get your, arm, your shoulder underneath their armpit, push up, and then give them help. One person, two person. Just get them out of there. Urgent moves. Emergency moves are life and death. Urgent is I need to get them out as soon as possible, but I really want to protect them from any further injury. So I'm probably going to use what we're going to call spinal motion restriction, 
we're going to keep them move from moving their back any more than possible. So I'm going to use some different tools, maybe a backboard, maybe a, a collar around their neck, some way to get them to move out of the situation they're in into a new location that I can transport and treat them easier. Non-urgent moves. Nobody cares when they move. They need to get moved to the eventually to the hospital, but we can take our time and figure out what we want to do the best. So take all the all the precautions you can. Use all the tools. We're going to bring out a lot of different tools and let you guys play with them in class. So you're going to get an opportunity to try all the options and know what might work best for you at the given situation. So other patient carrying devices, stretchers or cots. That's the wheeled ambulance uh, device. We have power cots now. They provide a battery uh, assist and a lift so you can move them up and down with the patient. We have manual stretchers, which are a lot lighter than the power cots, but you have to lift them completely by muscle power. And then we have bariatric stretchers. The power cots or the manual cots typically go to 500 to 650, 650 pounds. Bariatric stretchers, I've seen them that go up to 1,500 pounds. Um, biggest patient I've ever had is right around 1,000, but I've heard good stories about patients that were more than that. So use your bariatric options if you've got them. This is your typical power cot. It's got the wheels up front that go in the back of the ambulance. You hold the foot. The cot actually brings the, the undercarriage up and you slide it into the ambulance. Security Fire, where we may be doing some clinicals this time, actually has a device that comes out from the ambulance and slides underneath the cot and pulls it back in. So you don't even have to pick the patient up. It just grabs them and pulls them in for you, which is really, really a nice little feature. There's just another version. The previous one we looked at was a Striker. This is a Ferno power cot, just different brands. I haven't seen a Ferno in this region, but uh, the Striker is pretty much the only one you have in the, the market here. This is the bariatric stretcher. It has the ramps and the extra handles so you can get the patient up in the ambulance. Some people have said that this is a little embarrassing for your patient because they are being winched up with a, uh, a power winch and ramps. In the past, we would use a forklift and a U-Haul. So I think this is much better than we've had done in the past. So it's, it's something that's going to have to be done in the future. You're going to run into it. There are more and more patients that need this, op, this uh, specialized equipment. Talked about the stair chairs. They'll go into tight places. You can get them up and down stairs. You can get them in the elevators a little bit better. We do have spine boards or backboards. Short backboards, they're kind of falling out of style. I've got some I'll show you. The long backboards, pretty much the way of uh, we treat patients now. They, we use it for spinal motion restriction if we have some patient that has a suspected spinal injury. But we can also use them to move patients from point A to point B. They make a really good one called a split stretcher. It's one that we can put underneath the patient. When we get them on the cot, we can actually disassemble it and go both ways and split it in half so that we can take it out from underneath the patient so they don't lay on the hard board all the way to the hospital. Here's a picture of the stair chair. It's got the handles on the foot, handles on the top, and you just wheel your patient like a dolly. This is the long spine board, back boards. You see they come in different styles. The, the two on the left actually have the pins in them for the speed clips. The one on the right does not. Uh, speed clips are not something we use in this system, but they're used in several. It's a it's just a little clip that you put your strap in there and get your patient secured really fast. So we'll play with those. Everything we show you in these lectures are things we're going to actually pull out and play with. Other things you're going to run into, portal stretchers, scoop stretchers, basket, flexible stretchers, vacuum mattresses, all things we've got here that we're going to try out 
and learn what they are. So if you do run across them or you see a need that uh, they might come, they, they, they might be the perfect uh, tool to use, you'll know what it is. This is the split stretcher. This is the Frono model. There's a couple other different ones. We use the Hartwell uh, sp uh, split stretcher. I think it works a little bit better. This is your basket. This is the one you typically see for search and rescue. The, the ones here locally, they've got a huge wheel underneath that they can, uh, looks like an ATV wheel. You put it underneath it and then you just have people walk on it and it actually supports the weight. You just have to guide it down the trails. Or they have harnesses they can use for lifting and lowering the patients based on where they are. Something to know, uh, if you are using a helicopter to lift one of these, make sure it's big enough to get into the helicopter once you get them up. Uh, we've had an incident a few years ago where they hoisted the patient up and couldn't get the stretcher into the helicopter and they had to fly on the outside down to a landing zone to uh, an ambulance. I uh, bet it was a good ride. This is the uh, flexible stretcher. These fold up. You see these on uh, Chicago Fire all the time. That's what they put the patient on to get them out most of the time in that show. This is a vacuum mattress. You put the patient on it. You pull the straps and form it up around it. Then you suck all the air out and it gets really firm behind the patient, forms to every void on the back and behind the legs, behind the knees, and makes a perfectly form-fitting, customized split for the whole body. It's a really nice tool. Uh, we have them on all the ambulances. Not used as much as they probably should be, but it's, it's a great tool that you need to be familiar with. So this just shows him, for some reason, he took the straps off before he sucked the air out, so it's not going to be a good form, but we're, we'll teach you the right way. All right, when we're trying to put a patient onto a carrying device, it kind of depends on how our assessment of that patient, based on what we think might have happened to them, or what we're going to call the mechanism of injury, or what we think might be wrong with them based on our assessment. So we're going to uh, try to, if we suspect there's a potential for spinal injury, we're going to protect the head, neck, and spine before we move, while we move, and then after we move. So we're going to hold everybody in, in hold the patient's head in, in place, and then as we move them, we're going to try to keep the head and neck from moving. And we're going to teach you how to do this fairly easily. The best way to get the person is to tell them to move without hurting themselves, and they will get up and move on their own much better than we can move them. But if they can't, we're going to have to do the protection. Uh, if we have no suspected spinal injury, everybody grab a leg or an arm. Maybe I could, like we showed on that one where you go up underneath the armpits and grab the wrists. Another person grabs around the knees and you can pick the patient up and set them on the cot. So we're going to practice that one uh, when we're playing around with uh, potential patients. This kind of shows that one. You can turn, walk away from them. Or you can walk toward or be facing them. Just however's comfortable for you and however comfortable it is to get your patient up on the on the cot where you want them. Direct ground lift, everybody's down, lifting them from the ground to the stretcher. Sliding your arms up underneath. Here's a hint from years of experience. Be cautious when you're sliding your hand anywhere around between the waist and the mid thighs. Sometimes patients uh, have accidents and as you slide your arm in, you find that. So be careful, uh, use a little caution there. Maybe uh, have your partner take that, you grab the head first. Somehow kind of avoid that one. Once you get them up, raise them to your knees and then you use your legs to stand up and put them over on the cot. Best if you get the cot to their level. That way you don't have to slide them too much or use one of our other devices to lift them up. We've got another tool that I don't think we show here. It's called the combo cot. It's like a big blanket with handles. You can roll it up underneath the patient and then use the handles to pick them up. It's a uh, kind of like a draw sheet method here, direct carry, just kind of moving your patient around. Here's a draw sheet method. If you actually took a tape measure, you think those are 20 over 20 inches? Probably are. 
but because you're moving downhill, you're reaching. You're, it's not quite as bad as if it was uh, some uh, other situation. So we're going to grab the edge of the sheet and pull them towards us. Get them onto the bed. Get them comfortable. Do not worry about getting the sheet back to the patient or getting them uh, off the sheet. That just goes with them, and the hospitals work it out in the long. If the patient has any type of suspected uh, nausea, vomiting, you think they are going to compromise their airway, put them in the recovery position. This is something you should have learned in CPR class, but we're going to keep their head kind of pointed down so if they do vomit, gravity takes over for us. Positioning for shock, we used to put them down on their back and put their legs up in the air. It's called the Trendelenburg position. We do not do that anymore. Through uh, lots of research and uh, lack of findings, we discovered it really doesn't help your patients. So we just put them in the supine position and keep them comfortable. Once you get to the hospital, you're going to use the draw sheet to get the patient over to the hospital bed. Get everything as level as possible. You'll have plenty of help to move them some key things to remember before you move your patient to the bed in the hospital. Unbuckle them. Take your seat belts off. Undo your IVs. Undo your oxygen. Make sure they're not connected any way to the cop before you start pulling on them. And then you can start moving them to the hospital bed. So you see we've got the bed all evened out there, ready to go. You're going to move them gently to the bed so they don't bounce all over. Here they're reaching across, grabbing the patient over on the bed. They, You notice they took the whole sheet off the ambulance cot. That's fine. They work it out as a trade between the two facilities. And then you finally give a report. One thing this picture does not show that you really should be doing is putting the guardrails up. Anytime you've got a patient in a bed that uh, could roll, you need to have rails up.